First, let's look at teaching. Uh, teaching at its essence is modeling some form of intelligence. Intelligence being the efficiency with which energy, time, money, natural resources, attention, etc., is transformed into human well-being, then teaching or effective teaching is modeling, sparking, inspiring, instigating movement in the direction of well-being. Well-being is, of course, a continuum. You have the most elegant s s uh, geometric shape in the universe being a sphere uh, as the most efficient way to move mass from one location to another. Uh, it's, it's, it's a profoundly intelligent shape. And so in the momentum, in the momentum of intelligence, what we're looking for is growth. We're looking for movement in the direction of well-being. And more importantly, in the direction of a more efficient transformation of energy into well-being relative to the status quo. Uh, you have a continuum of well-being that is an infinite continuum and wherever one is a useful teaching takes one a little bit closer to well-being um, and in in terms of the you know the efficiency or what is good teaching uh, there is also a continuum of, of absorption in in the same way that you have uh, with food if you put too much sugar too quickly into the body, the body turns it into fat because it can't process the energy and it actually becomes toxic over time, as noted by uh, the obesity epidemic. So we have uh, highly refined starch things that turn so rapidly into energy that then need to be stored as fat, and we keep doing that, ultimately slowing the body down. So a teaching, uh, in a certain extent, has to be attuned to the audience, has to be attuned to a given state of being. Um, you know, if, if you have a giant boulder sitting on top of a cliff, that uh, is blocking an important view. A house is behind, your house is behind, giant boulder blocking an important view. The view opens up with it thinking, with it pleasure, with it joy. Uh, the crudeness of the teaching can be as simple as everyone push and topple the boulder off of, of the cliff and, you know, have it run down the valley, uh, you know, and lodge itself into a, into a stream somewhere. And the, the, the opening is achieved somewhat crudely. Uh, a more sophisticated form might be to break it up into little bits and saw it and all of that. But teachings can be very crude. Let's all push here. Let's do this and experience uh, the results. Um, the, the teaching intersects with a given level of consciousness. And a given level of consciousness can be measured in one sense by the degree of attuned distinctions, meaning if one can break the sphere into 300 million lines, 300 million planes all becoming and framing uh, a sphere in that paradox that a sphere is one of uh, an infinite number of straight lines or, uh, or you know, a curve, that um, in, in a in a teaching to give a 10,000 distinction system of moving when you've got a consciousness that can grapple with uh, work and life, uh, work-life balance, work-life balance. I've got a, you know, a, a dualistic consciousness. Is it work? Is it life? Um, and, and here you impose or suggest the grace of 300,000 separate distinctions. It's just too much. Which is it? You know, what do I need to do? More work or more life? 
Um, and so it, the, the evolution in such a, you know, such a situation might be to say a third, you know, that you have, you know, the, the, the transcendent spirit, the, the, the mundane pleasures of the body, the, the, the generation of work, and perhaps move it to a five-part system where you have uh, meaningful relationships where you you know and uh, where you have uh, the inner growth and development then you have your physical health then you have your productivity skills then you you develop a bigger system that uh, suggests a greater point of grace from this tension which is it work or life work or life you know one or the other um, and, it, and it can move things forward now, what I want to talk about is um, the, the way that reality is a fractal holographic pattern. And in that sense, within each human being, within each human being, there is a thread that goes all the way back to source and all the way forward to source. That connects us to the past, the present, and the future. That connects us at varying degrees of intensity to the most ephemeral echoes. You know, when we're in California, uh, a minor fire in, in Phuket, Thailand, doesn't have a lot of impact but it has some. If you're really paying attention, uh, you can follow the thread. You can feel the impact. It's just at a very refined level. And so while each of us in that sense is a fractal pattern of the whole, and thus through the lens, the zoom in lens of the, of the, the telescoping human ego that fixates on this thing and then this thing and then this thing over here and and uh, often sees them as completely separate objects because we don't look, uh, by the very nature of a zoom-in lens, we don't see the whole. We don't see the forest for the trees. We don't see the holographic pattern. We see this dot and this dot and don't quite see how they fit together. The, very, uh, the benefit of a zoom-in lens is an incredible, exquisite attention to detail. Uh, the weakness of a zoom in lens is losing context. Um, and the, the weakness of human consciousness is the forgetting of context. But within us, we have true and authentic signals within us that connect us to everything else. And I am a teacher. One of the things that integrates me, one of the things that comes natural to me, one of the things that I enjoy is teaching, is shedding light on patterns that might be useful. And uh, in the process of, of teaching, there's a, a whole variety of different things going on. Uh, one of them is that um, my own imagination is, is, is so rapid and ephemeral that I get lost in the complexity uh, when I don't slow the process down at times to journal, write books, have conversations, and make videos. And so it is the process of grounding the probability field into an actuality of expression that helps me grapple with some of the larger objects um, that I'm perceiving in terms of patterns. So that's you know, one thing, which is a pattern of teaching by learning or learning by teaching. Um, and so if, if, if things are, are, are not quite in focus and there's hundreds of probabilities and different things all going on and I ground it down to a chapter, there's a way that I can, the, the, the human ego can remember and grapple with the chapter 
in a way that I cannot fully perceive and stay conscious of the ephemeral multidimensionality probability field that's all around. You know, it could be like this from this perspective and this from this perspective and there's this image and there's that image. And, um, and so, you know, this, this is a, uh, you know, a, a challenge. So it, I learn by teaching. Um, then there's another phenomena going on, which is that um, if, if we can imagine that parts of ourselves, parts of ourselves in this fractal pattern of connectivity, of ecological framework, parts of ourselves send out a clear signal to the human ego that has to, to develop a framework much like a digital camera, if you have a 280p uh, processor, um, 280 pixels is not a very big, clear image of a screen. And so you get, you, you grid down the, the rendition of reality that you're seeing is through the lens of the human ego. And so the question is, how pixelated is the human ego? How crude is the human ego? Does it have blind spots? Are all the pixels working? And um, the human ego, in a sense, constructs constructs a, a dome around the consciousness that is within the human ego. And the consciousness that is within the human ego looks out at the consciousness that is outside of the human ego. And the consciousness that is within the human ego does not see reality it sees the, the, the zoomed in bits of reality that are allowed in to the human ego. So if you can imagine uh, a, a black dome over the head of the, the human ego, the ego is that dome that creates the illusion of separation, but it is also a dome that is designed by the ego, which bits of the dome will be transparent and which parts of the dome will be opaque. And those parts of the dome that will be opaque, which are most of them, if you look at the human body as that dome, you can see that it is largely opaque. It is a black dome. But into that black dome, we carve this little thing called an eye and this little thing called another eye. And the eye is designed to let certain frequencies of light become conscious. Now, there are infinite frequencies of light and, en and energy, but certain of them will become conscious. And then we create two little holes in the black dome here. And we let in something that we, we call smell. Again, vibration at a frequency that this little hole says that's a smell. Now, there's a whole f infinite number of frequencies of energy that is above and below and to the left and to the right of what this little orifice can perceive. That's the part of the hole that gets in. And we drill two other little holes in the black dome and they are tuned to pick up uh, a small part of the bandwidth that is sound. You see, because there are sound waves that are 200 miles long and they don't register in the, in the human, human ear. And then there are sound waves, you know, that are so high on the Hertz spectrum that they don't register as sound either. They may reg registrate as microwave heat, for example, the problem with our cell phones. Um, so we have this dynamic of a black dome with a few little tiny holes poked in so that a little bit of reality within certain spectrums comes into the dome. And so naturally the ego in that isolated, insulated state within the dome feels incredibly separate. But the dome springs out of the ecology, which is infinite and all around. We are infinitely connected. It's just that from the inside of the dome, we don't see out. Now, I'm in a little box in my little dome with my various fears and, and delusions and all of these things. And um, 
and I'm looking out and I'm looking at patterns and I'm looking at vistas. And by definition, all of them are wrong, meaning they're not the full and most beautiful and complex pattern, which is on a continuum. So that's not the question. The question is, are they more right? Are they more right than what was there before? Are they more right than the status quo in terms of what? In terms of intelligence, the efficiency of transforming energy into human well-being. Um, and that's on a gradient. And so just as with a stepping stone path, if you, if you have... Uh, you know, if you have a stepping stone path and every step has a label, one, two, three, four, five, six, you see, if you're on stepping stone six and you're heading towards the house, then stepping stone seven is a step in the right direction. If you're heading away from the house, then stepping stone five is in the right direction. And once you take a step to, to number seven as you're heading to the house, now, number six is in the wrong direction. And this is very important to understand in these continuums where there is no perfection, so to speak. Uh, the, there's no, there's, there's, you know, the, on these continuums towards elegance. You see, you can have seven colors, you can have 20 colors. A computer refracts the light spectrum down to 256 million distinctions much more than the human eye can track if you're you know if you're looking at the the at the whole the, at more than a million versions of yellow and you looked at one right next to each other you can't tell the difference the computer is telling the difference but your eye is not that sensitive and so uh, in 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 that sense there will be computers that create 10 trillion colors which will be even more irrelevant at some level in terms of human perception. But a 10 trillion distinction of color is going closer to the truth of infinite distinctions. It's going closer to that point where, where the sphere that is an infinite number of lines becomes the one. Because you have the sphere is one and it's infinite planes and infinite number of lines. Now, um, as I look out of my little hole, my little, my little uh, black dome through the little specks provided, um, you know, and then expand that through, you know, the much more transcendent technology, which is imagination. The ability to leave the black dome and look at reality from multiple different directions in multiple ways. As I do that, reality becomes much bigger than just the little bit that my senses are perceiving. And as I integrate and synergize, etc., there are times when the truth bandwidths broadcasting out from all faces of reality seem to come into confluence. It's as if there's a faraway radio signal there's a faraway radio signal halfway around the world, and it's sending out a clear message of beauty, truth, and goodness, a clear message. And it's making its way along the curvature of the earth, losing intensity. And so you need, within this black dome of the human ego, you need a very good antenna to pick it up. But the most important thing to understand is when you're listening to a signal in the far past, in the far future, in the far uh, expansion of the ecological framework in, of reality of which we are a part, and, of that, and as a result through which we can get such information. What is information? It is energy in a formation that can deliver a message. What is the message? The message is a structure, is a pattern. And useful information is a pattern that facilitates well-being. Non-useful 
information or patterns are just things that get in the way. You open the mail and there is a giant box. And you open the box and there's nothing in it. So then there's another box and another box and you start filling your living room up with giant cardboard boxes that have nothing in it. They are information. They are energy in a formation. It's just not terribly useful. You go back into a, a lifetime broadcasting out the events that ripple out, much like telescopes, etc. You know, the universe, uh, you know, ha has a cycle in time and space, and so you can look back in time with these long telescopes. They have to be very, very sensitive in order to see what happened a long time ago. Well, the same is true within the psyche. You have to be very, very sensitive. You have to be very, very still in order to hear a sound from another lifetime. But let's say you, you discover that you ate peanut butter and jelly in the 14th century uh, and had a, a left tooth that was off and it comes through clearly. Uh, okay, you fill your living room up with information like that. What are you going to do with it? And um, so what I find is that um, if, if we use these metaphors and these analogies, is that uh, there is a signal. There is, there is a probability field, meaning there are some rough components within me that facilitate teaching. These could be considered a radio set with a decent antenna. There's probability field there. There's also uh, in the transmission terrain. You know, my human ego with all of its various limitations and inadequacies um, transmits sound on various frequencies uh, based on this reality. And of course, the antenna, the antenna that is listening for those more subtle sounds picks up the vibration from my own transmissions and from you know my partner's transmissions, etc., and so the, the the vulnerability with more esoteric information traveling over a larger time space continuum in in a more subtle form is not that it isn't there. For example, if the human ear was capable, we would hear every radio station on the chan in the world. It's not capable, or we wouldn't be able to think all those jumbled sounds at once. We tune it out. But they're there in very, very subtle, minute echoes within the soundscape, within different frequency levels that are around us but that we don't pick up. And so in a sense of, 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 of teaching, I think it's a good thing to assume that throughout the history, that at any moment, that at any moment, there is someone, somewhere, someplace that knows more than we do about the given thing that we're exploring. And so there, there's, there's uh, whatever it is that we understand and see there's a better rendition of it. If even in the archetypal level you know, before it comes refracted down into a, a human and, and physical state. Even if it's, if it's in the translation of mathematics into culture, that there's a, a truer version of it. And so, in that sense, whatever we're saying is imperfect. But is it more perfect than what's there before? Um, my sense as I explore the probability field, the probability field uh, of my own antenna, uh, the probability field of intelligence, the probability field of attunement, um, meaning in order to be a good teacher, one has to first of all have an antenna that picks up useful information. And I say an antenna because to a large extent, wherever we are in time and space, 
is highly unlikely to be the epicenter of whatever it is at the most perfect form for a given truth. And so in that sense, if we can benefit from the resonant fields in the past, present, and future, in the left and right, in the probability field, the odds of getting uh, a, a more intelligent package of information goes up. So there's an antenna. Then there's also the ability to direct the antenna to tune the channel. Um, this is very important. If you go on YouTube, for example, uh, do you watch cat videos? Or do you study the skyscrapers of the world? Or do you study the, the goddess symbols throughout history? And why? Meaning, how does this connect to your well-being, the well-being of your cult, the well-being of your family, the well-being of your country? How does this connect? And is it useful? Is it, a help? Is it also a next step? Um, meaning, is it digestible? Is it too much or too little, etc.? Is it a next step? Finally, you have a dynamic of uh, the being able to broadcast that which is heard through the amplification of the human sensor, sensor in, the, in the here and now, and which goes through a distortion field, meaning that, that information, only a certain amount is let into the black box because duct tape has been placed over this bit because that part didn't want to see. You know, the, 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 a lot of the opacity of the human ego comes from the, the lack of neutrality around various points in, in the largely emotional energy spectrum. So if we don't want to look at this shame, this shame is over here. So we put up some duct tape and we, 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 we wall off that part of, uh, you know, of, the, of the dome. And now we don't have to look at shame over there. But we also can't receive the energy coming from what is beyond the shame in the current direction. If we think of shame as like a boulder that was out in that direction and we're looking out of what was initially a transparent dome, as, as we see certain fears that we don't want to see, as we see certain thoughts, I don't want to accept that I'm greedy. So, okay, my greed is out there. Okay, we'll, we'll duct tape that part of the dome up so that I don't get to have to see my greed. And over here, uh, I, you know, I don't want to see that my mother hated me. That's a terrifying feeling. I don't want to feel it. Okay, so everything that my mother did that hated me, I've got to, to tape it over. And then the adolescent, perhaps, that, you know, is delighted to punish, you know, every fault in the parent, wants to see the hatred, but doesn't want to see the mother's love, the mother's nurturing, the mother's kindness. And so that gets taped up over here. And this age tapes this bit up, and this age tapes this bit up, and this age tapes this bit up, and this age tapes this bit up. And the other one says, don't tell me about the future. So the whole future front pane and windshield gets blocked off with a big four by eight piece of plywood. And it's like, I don't know what's coming. Of course not. There's a piece of plywood just put there and blocking all the vision of the future. Because, because I'm terrified. What if this happened? What if that happened? And so we end up in this very dark, paranoid, terrified cocoon, this dome that's kind of taped off with layer upon layer of trauma and duct tape and denial and anger, and then denial of the anger. No, I'm not angry. So we have to have the anger, then we have to tape up the anger. And it's like we're in this dark little place, feeling isolated, feeling alone, feeling miserable. And yet, Pieces of truth, divine wisdom, music, joy, etc., makes its way through the little orifices that remain. Sometimes uh, the entire psyche has been walled off into this paranoid thing, but we can still hear with the physical ears that, unless we cut those off or put on headphones, etc., which we can flood with all kinds of information, but stuff can still come in through the senses, the densest form. 
that can still come into our little dome. We saw something and there's a chance for transcendence. Transcendence of what? The limitations of the myopic state within the dome that's called you know, the sensate physical ego. Well, I experienced myself very much as a paranoid, scared, lonely, terrified, exhausted, uh, what if this happens, what if that happens, etc. type of personality and energy. Um, and there's very much a, a sense of, of all of these different things going on. And uh, through various slits in my kind of encased dome, certain patterns, certain frames of information come in that are significant, that seem potent. They may be boxed in because there's not a full 360 degree dome to perceive them in, but there's a, a certain sense of wow and wonder. And then the question is, does any of the information come up, stir up the ego? Because the ego is a broadcaster. And if you can imagine picking up a shortwave signal all the way around the planet, and the ego not liking some information, What's, let's say the ego has investments in a Brazilian rainforest, and a news report starts coming in about the Brazilian rainforest losing value. Well, my ego can pipe up and broadcast, no, it isn't, no, it isn't, it's not losing value, it was a great investment, etc. And that, that energy is going to be very loud. And so, as a receiver, as a teacher receiver, um, I'm fiddling around with those antennas. Um, you know, some of them were opened up in a psychedelic experience um, with Peter Sandhill. Uh, and some of them were opened up in meditation. Some of them were opened up uh, in, you know, with, with channeled information that kind of guided me in certain quadrants to look here. Some of them are opened up in dreams. Um, some of them are opened up through speaking and just noticing and letting go and seeing what wants to come through my mouth as words, as, as, as a way of allowing. And, um, and so a good way to uh, look at the various teaching projects that I do is that there is a deep connection to certain sources, certain broadcasters of incredibly valuable information, energy, in a formation that can be healing, that can create wholeness. That there's a lot of interference with my wounded and rebellious child and adolescent and young adult that spike and combat and kind of broadcast and in a certain sense, play and rebel against that information. That energy vibration comes in and they say, prove it to me or this, or I don't like that, or I get off in a tangent with this, that, and the other. And so uh, energy is, is you, know, you know, fiddles around in that type of pattern. Still makes its way into the dome and, and, um, and at its best, those wounded and small parts of me heal, integrate through the battle in a certain sense. Because through, if all they know how to do is to fight, for example, there's still a contact with the other, with the information, with the energy information in the battle. Uh, and so there's, there's a certain delight in the battle and um, you know, a, a, a certain, you know, uh, combativeness and all that. Um, and, and then some of it comes through beautifully and true. And I'm at a point where about 30% of the time or 20, maybe about 20% of the time, 30% of what I'm reframing and broadcasting out is a very clear rendition 
of what's coming in. So 20% of the time. And one of the, the things that's challenging in a culture like ours is where do you develop where do you develop attunement with transcendent energy information, with transcendent information? You go to church and you're told to be guilty and dull down. You go to uh, meditation schools and they, it's often quite dull. You know, do your red chakra, do this, that, and the other. And, and meanwhile, there's all this stuff that's not being talked about. Um, and so there's, there's a mixture of, of different energy and, and, uh, and vibration and stuff. There's a mixture of, is this good? Is this bad? Is this, uh, you know, what's going on here? And, um, if you just read books, you can, you can be in your head. And so I've chosen to, uh, create you know, videos and, and video environments and media environments very much as a way of practicing and attuning and connecting. And what I, what I experience as I do these kinds of things is that I, I, can, I can usually at some point in the voicing find the thread that I'm actually trying to tune into. And that's a first achievement. Like, ah, that's the channel I'm trying to tune into. Secondly, I can then notice different integrities and, you know, and breaches with that signal. Um, and then thirdly, I can notice my own reactive energy, meaning my personality within my little cave of, you know, within the black dome of, of taped off areas, etc. No, that's not true. That's and so I have my own small part within the dome that reacts. And in the process of just voicing all of that, the signal clears up some. The signal clears up some. And then I have a presence which often moves beyond words. And that presence blesses, fills, makes life worth living, heals and integrates. It's like pouring water into a parched desert toad or snake. Uh, you know, the, there's this sense of coming back of a cell, a cancerous cell perhaps restoring its translucent so that the membrane of chemicals that want to nourish the cells and the membrane so that toxins within the cell can be taken out of the body. So that, that, that membrane connection is reestablished. And this goes back to that pattern of uh, the sense that everything else, the sense that everything else is um, that everything else is the larger body of which we are a part. And that so much of what is called spiritual is really transcendent. And transcendence is about the consciousness moving beyond that which is within the black dome to the point of realizing that the black dome, the human ego, is integrally connected to its ecology to the expansion and awareness that we are not the black dome, that we are the one who dreamed, we are the one who saw, we are the one who playfully imagined and scattered ourselves into many shapes, including black domes called human egos or translucent domes of human egos that could look out within the dome and have control over how much to let in and how much to, to block out, and thus to create a rendition of reality. Because if you can think of the, the lens capacity as beliefs and thoughts and attitudes and feelings and intentions and choice, the lens capacity within the human ego, if we think of that, uh, then we can realize that when you have infinite spectrums of energy on the outside 
and you have a membrane and you get to decide how much of that infinite energy on the outside you let in, you realize you create your own reality, which is the reality inside the dome, um, by deciding what to let in. For example, you can put up duct tape and say, oh, that's an ugly image, I don't want to see that. Um, and you can also roll your little dome over and participate in changing that part of geography. You can plant a tree, you can plant a garden, you can uh, open an idea. And so there is this playground uh, of creating a rendition of reality to our beliefs, to our likeness, because all the, the ego that is the consciousness that is inside the dome knows is that which is allowed to penetrate the dome and that which is manufactured within the dome. You know, you can create a little reality within the dome. You can also decide how much to, to let penetrate and you can also shut your eyes and block your ears and decide, no, I'm not going to see that. I'm going to see this. And in this way, uh, we create a rendition of reality. And uh, so 20% of the time, uh, often in more of a, of a, of a teaching-type mode, I'm 30% luminous. What does that mean? It means that through the little cracks in my egos and stuff, um, the cracks are big enough to let a relatively unfiltered uh, version, an ele a relatively unfiltered version of reality in to touch me, this ego. Uh, such that what comes out of my mouth is more of a rendition of that uh, as opposed to the, the little cultural constructs within uh, all the little you know, barriers and blockages that we put up to say, I won't feel this, I won't think that, I won't do this, I won't see that, etc., etc., etc. And uh, that's how I see my role and relationship as a teacher. And that's how I see each of you and each one of us is this same dome, the same opportunity to be on this infinite continuum, seeing a little bit more clearly, seeing a little bit more, seeing through different observing and measuring devices such as our hearts as well as scientific paradigms and, and stuff. Because a scientific paradigm is a very, 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 very tiny little piece of reality that allows some wonderful things to occur and some horrible things to occur in isolation. In the same way that if you took a book, any book, and you just deleted every word you didn't want to see, you could leave the the in this book and then you wait until it said world and you leave that and you delete black out all the rest and then you say leave is and then you find the word terrible somewhere and you say the world is terrible block and then that's it you block the whole rest of the book up and sure enough all that's in there the book says the world is terrible um, and it, there it is in that book and so that's my book I look it up yep, the world is terrible close my book but if you unpeel some of that black line, the world is also infinite number of other things. It's just, ah, that's confusing. Is it terrible or is it good? I, I want one or the other and I'm going to pick terrible because some of the times it is. And that is one of the sentences one can create out of the book. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Mm -hmm.